shut up and recant. Because there have been people before him, Giordano Bruno and others who weren't. Savonarola and so on. Oh, well, that, you know, that's nothing to be burnt. Oh, it is, it is, it is, it is. You really don't want to subject yourself to that. <coughs> Pretty awful. So uh, this, this problem of calling, demonizing things, calling things heretical, is a, has a very bad effect on thinking, creative thinking, as you know. So we're just coming out of that period. Sure, we're in the 20, 21st century. We've had two or three centuries, but just, just a bit. And you know, you see in the Middle East, they're not out of it yet. They're still living in that world. That's why people get beheaded and every other kind of thing, because there are groups that still feel that if you say the wrong thing, you should be have your head chopped off. And that's coming out of the medieval mindset. And um, you know, we think we're going to solve this in 20 years. We're not going to solve it in 20 years. It's going to take a couple of hundred more years to deal with this, to bring people out of these things. The best thing, actually, is the internet for doing this. The more people are open to international culture from various areas of the world, the more open and wide-minded they become. But some of these people use the internet against itself through viruses and other things and use the internet to develop terrorist uh, uh, activities. Through. So everything has its cancer. Jet planes have hijackers, internet has have viruses. Everything has its cancer. There's nothing that you can do as you move forward you have the op that will generate the opposite effect. So it just depends how fast civilization can move beyond this. So in our little way, in a class like this, I think we're trying to promote civilization. That is open-mindedness, looking at other sources, not declaring anything heretical a priori, looking at all texts equally, even though we might personally favor some. Why would we personally favor some? The reason we would personally favor some is simply a matter of cultural heritage. We like what we know, what's familiar. Look, you went to a certain high school. I don't know what that high school may have been, but you went to a certain high school. You know the sports teams and so on. So even when you leave or go to college, you support the sports teams of that school. You want to know what the well, in Los Angeles. You want to know what the Los Angeles Lakers do, or the or the or the or the Los Angeles Dodgers, or the Anaheim Angels, or one of those teams, or the Ducks. That's your. That's a local loyalty. The Arabs have a good name for it. They call it Asabiya. Pretty good name for it. It's group solidarity. Feeling of solidarity with the social group. And they said those bonds are very strong in the way they understood history when they were at the top of their cultural form in the late Middle Ages. The Islamic culture you know, was very advanced in the late Middle Ages. It's gone downhill, unfortunately, more recently but it was at a real high point in the 12, 1300s. And some of the most famous writers in around 1400 was a guy called Ibn Muldoon in Spain. And he wrote a whole history on the basis of Asabia, how strong the, the fellow feeling, the group solidarity was, made societies rise and fall. And as that deteriorated, the society or culture or city state or empire or nation state also began to fall away. And our, if you look at our America now, our group solidarity seems to be disintegrating a bit, so maybe we're in a, a difficult uh, Asabia situation ourselves. But in any case, your preference of certain documents is based on the fact you come into the world a blank sheet, a dope, a nothing, a baby. And you're introduced to a bottle or a breastfeeding, and then you're introduced to certain things like ice cream and certain other things of that kind, and then you get a habit on these things, it's like a drug, and you prefer them. You prefer what's familiar to you. A few people are different, they want what's unfamiliar. But most people want the tried and true, it's, oh, give me an American breakfast, or something like that, they go abroad, oh, there's no ham and eggs here, you know, <laughs> you know and so on and so forth. Now, cappuccino has become an in thing here, even in America, about 30 years ago, you go to Europe, the American tourist would, oh, Jesus, oh, all you have is cappuccino and uh, a croissant for, for breakfast, that's continental breakfast, I, I, I want some, I want an American breakfast. So, it's what you were familiar with, and that's the same with ideas. You go to a church, 
The Gospels become your culture, Jesus becomes your, your super being, and you develop an inordinate affection and attraction to him, whether you think it's justified or isn't justified. Then you become defensive about protecting him. For the Jews, it's the same. For the Muslims, it's the same. A Jewish person may not even have read the law of Moses, but he or she will, oh, you're insulting Moses? You're insulting me? What, the law of Moses is a myth? It isn't, he didn't get it on Sinai? And so the person's back goes up. Say something about Muhammad to a Muslim. It's almost like, you know, well, if they could, they would go outside your back and cut your head off. I've seen these stairs in my classes. Because I personally, with all due respect to any Muslims in the room, I don't like Muhammad as a person. And not that I don't respect him as a poet, I do, but I don't think he's a nice person. I think he's a bit bloodthirsty, and I don't think he uh, keeps his word or is decent in his behaving in his uh, relations with other people. And I think he's extremely uh, a megalomaniac in his, uh, in his approach to certain things. He's left us writings that purport to be his, so I can, uh, I can make that judgment. So uh, I like Islam as a cultural phenomenon. I think Islam is a very great cultural phenomenon. If I speak to a Muslim person and I say, you know, I love Islam, I think the culture is really fine, and I think it's higher than the Prophet itself, that can happen. I like Mormons a lot, and yet I think that they're probably on a higher cultural level than the Book of Mormon is. But if you say to a Mormon, you're on a higher cultural level than the Book of Mormon is, they'll get angry at you, because they have been told that the Book of Mormon is a high cultural problem. And I don't happen to think it is, but it doesn't matter, it's produced asabiya, you see. What I'm saying is produce this solidarity that the people are, feel, are, are, are closely bound together so it's achieved its purpose as, in a social way. And then the young people go out on missionary work and so on, regardless of what they're teaching or not, it doesn't matter what it is they're teaching, it's the experience of being together, the fellow feeling, the common experience, the group solidarity that produces the bond around a certain thing. So, in Islam, you can say the same thing. If you say then to a Muslim, well, I, I don't really think the Prophet's on the same level as the rest of this, they'll get really angry. They won't stop and think, well, maybe he's right. Let, let's, let's look at that. No, no, they don't, don't want to look at that. They get angry at you for saying it. And the next thing, if there's, a, if there's an extremist, and I've had enough of them in my classes to know, they've told me, if I met you someplace that wasn't someone on, I would kill you. They've told me. They've told me that which is so stupid, it's mind-boggling, but that's it, that's it, that's how they think.